Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Scheinerman. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and hello from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I see some folks already introducing themselves in the chat. If you if you can, please drop in where you're joining us from. And also, we're going to talk about Kiddushin today, but I um, but I know that we are also in the week of having left Gitin. So if you want to share in the chat something that you're going to be taking with you from Tractate Gitin, um, that would be lovely as a way. What are, what are the things we're actually going to take with us? I'd love to see what some of those are. But really today, we're going to be talking about um, Tractate Kiddushin. Um, so I want, to, I want to do two things. First, give you a broad overview of the Tractate and then look in on the pages that we looked at together. Um, so firstly, Kiddushin, welcome. Uh, here's an important point that I'm sure most of us are kind of already getting a sense of. Kiddushin is not marriage. And also, just to make things extra complicated, it's not engagement. The, the marriage process laid out in the Talmud is, um, is a two-step process. And the two steps don't correspond to modern, um, modern rituals in North America around marriage. The first step, which um, the Talmud says... Uh, which the Talmud calls Kiddushin. In the biblical text, it's often called Erusin. That text, um, that process is one which is kind of between engagement and marriage. At that point, it is exclusive to, right, the woman is exclusively sexually committed to the man, and she uh, would require a get if they, right, we from, take take that from Gitin, right? If the if the Kiddushin breaks up, they, she will require a get. She is sort of, uh, I believe the word that actually Dr. Scheinerman used in her wonderful piece is uh, on, on the first page is um, sexually exclusive or sexually reserved for this particular man. The second step, which could happen, you know, a day later, same day, or a year later, two years later, is what is called nisuin. And nisuin is essentially when they move in together, right? That's when they become actually married. And they, um, and at that point, the man is financially responsible for the woman. Now, that two-step process uh, is condensed in modern Jewish ritual. If you've been to a traditional Jewish wedding, they do Kiddushin and Nisuin together. So they're, it's hard for us to kind of tease them apart. But I think it is really important for us as we sort of jump into this, sometimes you'll read translations that'll say things like engagement and it's not engagement. Um, Kiddushin is its own thing, um, which is the first step in a two-step marriage process. Right, not a commitment to get married in the future, but it's the first step in a two-step marriage process. All right, so that's my like one word about what kiddushin is. Um, Dr. Shine, interject yeah. if you don't mind for ten seconds. I literally was. Literally, we thought about how to make this less confusing in the series, and so as you watch the pieces, we're editing them. So when we are talking about kiddushin or erusin, we use the word betrothal rather than engagement to distinguish it from modern engagement, because it is, it's not full marriage, but it does have legal significance in the way that contemporary engagement does not. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so in Tractate, tractate Kiddushin has um, four chapters. It's the shortest tractate in Seder Nashim about women. Um, and in the first chapter, and Emily, um, Emily has noted in the chat that what she's taking from Gitin is the juxtaposition between women and enslaved people. Um, so the first chapter of Tractate Kiddushin is about acquisition. Um, and right, so, so you're really taking that into Kiddushin, Emily. Uh, right, so the, we start with the acquisition of women through Kiddushin. And then we're going to continue our conversation in the first chapter to um, how other kinds of humans are acquired, animals, and land. The second chapter, we're going to look at Kiddushin when you're out of town. Um, so how can you affect 
personal status changes through an agent. In the third chapter, we're going to talk about conditional kiddushin, uh, problematic kiddushin, kiddushin maybe you shouldn't have actually made, and what their implications are for the people involved. And then, because for the rabbis, uh, you know, first comes kiddushin, then comes marriage, then comes a baby and a baby carriage, the fourth chapter is going to talk about the status of children from different kinds of marital unions. And I cannot. Um, I cannot recommend highly enough the wonderful piece that actually Dr. Scheinman wrote on the first page of uh, Kiddushin, on Kiddushin um, 2, really laying out some of the different terminology that the Talmud um, uses. Um, and she did not pay me to say that. So, you know, take that. But Today, what I really want to talk about, so we've got, we've done this broad overview, and I want to do a really, um, really zoom in for the rest of our time together into just pages two and three. Um, and so I want to talk about them because actually, and I know this is going to sound funny to folks who, you know, made it through Yavamot, but there's something really, really weird about the first couple of pages of Kiddushin. You may have picked up on, you may not have, but they're actually weird in a way that we haven't really seen before. And so I think it's worth sitting with that weirdness um, for a minute. And the thing that's weird here isn't the big moral and ethical questions. It's not the questions of, I know some of us have been wrestling with around personal status and, um, and, um, personal status and gender, things like that. This is actually weird in a completely different way that we haven't really focused on before. And so let me share my screen. I'm just sharing this as Safaria. So if you have this in front of you, great. If you don't, don't worry, I'll read it to us. But this is a selection from literally the first page of the DOF. Can you see it? Yes, amazing. Okay, so I want to just look at a selection of it, which is going to give us a taste for all of it. But when I expanded my screen, the selection disappeared. So give me 10 seconds. I'm going to find it again. Here we are. Amazing. The, the Gemara asks the question, and it's not the question you think it's going to ask. The Mishnah says there are three ways to acquire a woman. And the Hebrew word three in the Mishnah is articulated in the feminine, right? So um, Hebrew is a gendered language. Numbers can be in the feminine or the masculine, depending on whether you're counting feminine or masculine things. And so the question that the Gemara is asking is, why is the word three in a woman can be acquired in three ways? Feminine. Okay. Um, I'm very so you you probably don't all know this, but um, Dr. Scheinerman used to teach biblical Hebrew grammar, and so I'm extremely intimidated uh, to be talking about grammar in front of a genuine expert. So uh, please jump in if I'm getting this wrong. Um, so the the Gemara asks, why does it say three in the feminine? And then it answers because it wants to teach us ways, um, derachim. Uh, which is a feminine noun. If so, let it teach instead, right? If, but it should be in the masculine. So right, instead of saying ways, teach matters, the word davar, which is a masculine term, and then you could use the masculine. The Gemara answers, the Mishnah did do so because it wanted to teach intercourse as one of these ways, and intercourse is a way, um, and way is feminine. Now, I'm not interested in tracking the grammar. So if you just got lost, totally fine. What I am interested in is this. Why on earth in a Mishnah that is so evocative of so many things, and you know we've gotten emails and I, we've seen you all engage with this, the thing that the Gemara here wants to talk about is why are they using masculine verbs or feminine verbs and not masculine verbs? And are these nouns even feminine or masculine? And this is going to go on for about a page. Okay, I'm going to stop share because that was that was the piece I wanted to show. And let's be let's be real. 
Yes, Laura, right? You just noted that the weirdness for you is the focus on grammar and not just grammar, but feminine and masculine and trying to figure out, is there a rule? And what about these words that sometimes in the in the Torah seem to be maybe either feminine or masculine, depending on context? It's very strange. There's another strange thing about the, that, that same piece that Laura has noted, right? That, that page and a half on grammar. And that's that the whole thing is anonymous. There are actually, right, the, the Mishnah tells us, Beit Shammai said this, Beit Hillel said that. We move into the Talmud's discussion and there are no named people quoted. Which is really interesting, right? Both of those are things that we don't usually see. This focus on grammar and that long a block of anonymous conversation. Now, if you noticed that weirdness, great. If you didn't, totally great as well, uh, right? That's why we come together because we all notice different things. But I will say we are not the first people to notice that. In fact, that weirdness was already noticed by um, Rav Shrira Gaon in the medieval period. In the medieval period, Rav Shvira Gaon, who is one of the rabbis of the Jewish academies in Baghdad, says, he, he looks at this exact section of text and says, this is a section of text that is not actually produced by the Amari. He says, this is a section of text that is produced not by the Amoraim, but by the Savoraim. And I will put, um, actually, maybe Dr. Scheinman, can you type those words into the chat just so that folks who are having trouble spelling, um, not having trouble, I'm not asking you to spell, but so you know how they're spelled. Thank you. Um, now, cool. So it's not written by the usual people who we've been reading. It's written by this other group. Who are they? Excellent question. So glad you asked. They are the group who came after. Chronologically, according to Rav Shiragaon, they are the people who came after the Amoraim and who were the final editors and arrangers of the Talmud. So Rav Shira Gaon, already in the medieval period, says, yeah, this is really weird. And actually, what this tells us is a different group of rabbis wrote it. Um, now, what can we know about that group of rabbis? So I want to share with you here um, an idea that I read in a wonderful article by um, Dr. Yaakov Elman of Blessed Memory, who wrote a whole article about this section of Kiddushin. Um, and rather than have everybody go to an academic library and find it, I thought I would tell you what he says, which is, okay, if we're trying to figure out who this group of people is who wrote this thing, right, it seems pretty obvious once we say it, oh, this is actually quite different from what we're usually used to. And it's possible that they're later. Who would be likely to be the people who did this? So he argues that it has to be people who are using Aramaic, right? You get too late and all of a sudden people are talking in other languages, right? And in fact, medieval Baghdad, Rav Shira Gaon, the language they're actually using is Judeo-Arabic. So it's got to be people who live a little you know, later than the than the Amoraim, but before we switch to Arabic. And maybe it's people who are really um, huge grammar nerds. Grammar nerds, right? Because I think as we all can imagine now, not everybody's that into grammar. Um, and so it's got to be people who are into that. And so he suggests that it's actually this, this section and the people who are doing this work are doing this work in the 8th and ninth centuries. Right, so 200, 300 years after we usually think about the Talmud. Um, and that's a time when actually grammar nerd, grammar nerdiness was all the rage. Um, scholars of Islam were really into figuring out um, Quranic grammar at that time. The Karaites were trying to figure out biblical Hebrew grammar at that time. Um, the Masoretes were doing this work. Right. And so this is a time when people start really being very interested in grammar. And and we know that the rabbis are still using Aramaic. 
Um, and so, but this is also a really exciting time because this is a time when, I mean, it is exciting both for grammar nerds and for everyone else because it's a time of rapid change. The world the rabbis are living in is changing linguistically, but it's also changing from a Zoroastrian leadership to a Muslim leadership. There is a major plague in the sixth century that people are still um, grappling with. There are new climate realities at this time. And so we're in this moment of change where some group of people create the first couple of pages of Kiddushin. Um, and to, I would be delighted to uh, a link a reference to the article. Yes, it's, sorry, I'm bad at multitask. And that's the name of the article. I believe you could probably find it flowing around the internet in legal ways. Um, so I think, you know, this is a, a fascinating piece. And then just to add one more piece of then, Elman asks, okay, well, who would they be talking to? And I want to read this to you because I actually think it's just that fun. Um, and he's he says he's doing a work of imagination. So this is a little speculative, but I think sometimes uh, speculation is valuable. Is it not possible, he writes, that the Rosh Yeshiva was called upon to open the semester with a general lecture at which the political and financial supporters of the yeshiva were in attendance, and that he would utilize these circumstances to strengthen their regard and support for the work of the yeshiva. If they do reflect opening lectures to an audience wider than the members of the Gaonic yeshivot, they make an argument for the interest, vitality, relevance, and authority of the Sevoraim and the Gaonim and not incidentally, an argument for their just claim for financial and other support from that wider community. In a world where, right, and that's the end of the quote, in a world where the big uh, the big people, the, the current of the day was to care about grammar, when you are in a yeshiva and you are trying to get other people to be involved and invested in the work of the yeshiva, maybe you kick off the conversation by saying, I'm going to connect this to something you're already interested in. Which I th think is, is really, really fascinating. And as a reminder for us, we're going to be jumping into all kinds of, um, all kinds of conversations about the, the, the details around, um, around all different kinds of acquisitions and other things like that. But if we take a step back, sometimes we, we get a perspective on something that's completely different. If we look at this from a different angle, we can see access to all other different kinds of information. Um, and I really wanted to start with this today. And then what I'll do is I'll open up for questions in our last five minutes. But I really wanted to start with this because I think what this already tells us is even in the Talmud, the discussion of Kiddushim goes across centuries and generations, even more than we already thought, right? We are sort of used to, there's the Mishnah, and then there's the Talmud, and so we've got the second century, and then we've got maybe the fourth or fifth century. But already in the medieval period, Rav Shira Gaon points out, actually, even in the Talmud, that conversation goes on for hundreds of years um, beyond when we might think of it. And what I really think is a value in, in, in this context is a reminder to all of us that the conversation is ongoing, right? This text is going to um, give us traditions from almost a thousand years, but time continues and we're still having that conversation. And I think there is value in seeing that conversation that we're having as part of this broader legacy. So that's what I wanted to share with us today. I know it's a little more technical than we we usually do, but it seems like a helpful reminder to all of us of the kinds of conversations that people have had. Um, and so that was what I had prepared. 
But what questions do you have about key douching as we jump on it? Or Dr. Scheinman, if there's anything you want to add in. No, thank you. I don't think we've actually in all of this series really discussed the Savoraim uh, so much um, or or in detail, the history of the scholarship of the layers of the Talmud and its its growth and competition. We, we uh, composition. <laughs> we do. We do. We do know there's like mission and then there's a Gemara that comments on it. But um, yeah. it, it does get. It, it, if you're looking at a text that develops over that many hundreds of years, you could imagine that there is more cultural shift that happens in between. Right. Get more complicated. Um, and the scholarship on it in the last century has been really exciting. Um, I looked for Yaakov Elman's article and I don't find it in a place that's not behind a paywall so far. Uh, but nice. if somebody else has discovered it not behind a paywall, please feel free to share. In the meantime, I did link an article on My Jewish Learning in the chat. It's a reprint. It's a little bit old, but it does give an overview of both these three layers of Talmud, the Tanaim, who composed the Mishnah and the, and the Tosefta and all the Brightas that we're finding as we go through the Talmud. Um, and then, of course, the Amoraim, who are the named rabbis who are discussing all that material. And then the Savoraim. Also, I sometimes see Saboraim with a B. Um, yeah. It can be a little confusing, but B and V are the same in Hebrew, same letter. Um, and and it also talks a little bit about the scholarship. Uh, bo both Rav Shurga owns letter, the, the letter from over a thousand years ago, which was an early statement about the composition of the Talmud. Uh, and the modern scholarship. So that uh, that short article, it's maybe a thousand words or so, is in the chat. Um, but let's see if you've got some questions now in the chat. Amazing. Uh, well, and I do just want to say, because I realized I didn't say this, the Saboraim worked anonymously. One of the characteristics of them is that we don't get their names. So that's another, right, when we notice that long chunk without any attributions, that was another um, flag for scholars. Okay, I'm seeing like some questions. Like to Dr. Ronas on why they don't use names? Uh, they are men of mystery. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. There are, there are a number of scholarly theories about that, but that is going to take us way into the wee hours of the evening. So, um, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so I want to, um, I've got some questions that are broader and then some of the questions that are just to me. So let me answer, uh, a couple, um, the, First question is the nuances of a man who acquires a wife and a woman being acquired. So I do want to point out, and I think several of um, our our writers are, have also pointed this out, that it is um, the Mishnah talks about the man as the active, um, but actually not really because it in the passive, a woman is acquired in three ways. The Talmud suggests that that means that she has to agree. Um, that that it's not about somebody going out and grabbing someone else and saying, tag, you're mine. It's about um, an act performed with consent and intention. So, um, so I, I do think that's a really important thing for us to understand. The, the Talmud throughout is going to assume that the woman or um, if she is a minor, her father has intentionally consented to marriage. And if she is a child, then by the time she is um, um, an adult, she has to consent as well. Um, I see a couple of questions from folks asking, are the Saboraim the same as the Stam? Um, ish, which is to say that some people divide the Talmud's development anonymously, uh, not anonymously, um, chronologically, and other scholars divide the Talmud just by attribution, not attribution. So when people talk about the Stam or the anonymous layer, they're not necessarily saying it's later. Scholars who think that it is later um, specifically often use a different term, but that is so into the weeds of how scholars um, and academics debate this. So um, if you were like, are those the same? I would say ish. Um, Carol asks, why is the focus on the word derech? Is it related to darche shalom or the derech of the Torah? Why this word? 
Um, so I would give two answers to that. The first is um, because that's what that's the word the Mishnah uses. Um, and the second is because it's one of those really fun words in Hebrew that has um, in biblical Hebrew with grammatical confusion. Um, so I think the the uh, there is some some you know uh, they are moving they are moving into this in a variety of ways um but like i i imagine for every single one of us when we read the mishnah the first thing we didn't think was wait why is shalosh in the feminine and not the masculine right and so it is they are making a choice about what to focus on that is a different choice than i'm guessing most of most of us today would have made if we were just given the Mishnah. And that tells us something about what they care about in a way that I think is really interesting. I think we have time for maybe, yeah. Oh, can I, can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. I won't tell you. Do. do you think that there's a, there's a cross fertilization between the Savoraim who are very interested in grammar and the Masoretes? who are mostly living right in the land of Israel and Tiberias and things who are also super interested in grammar. They're the ones who give us the can the, the voweling and the cantillation and the final form of the Hebrew Bible. And they are experts on grammar and really interested in it too. And they're roughly the same centuries, right? So do you think there's like, maybe just like those are centuries when people got really excited about grammar? Is there cross fertilization? Do, do you know anything about yeah, that? I so, so I would say two things. Um, I don't necessarily know what a direct relationship might have looked like. But what I can say is that both groups are living in places where there's really, really active Arabic grammar happening um, and Karaite grammar happening. Karaites are a group of Jews who do not, um, who do not trace themselves to rabbinic authority um, and have their own um, histories of interpretation. They still exist today um, and are, you know, a really good reminder that the diversity of Jewish life isn't a new phenomenon or isn't only a new phenomenon. Um, and so did the Masoretes and the rabbis of Baghdad talk to each other? I don't know, but certainly I think what we can see is across cultures and religions and regions Lots of people are caring about grammar at this time. And I think that's also a really important, um, and I see a couple of folks in the chat notice from Giti the question of the Aguna. That's another piece we're going to see a lot of in this tractate and seems to be a real concern. And I think what, what that tells us is the rabbis who produced these texts wanted to make them meaningful to the people who lived in their communities. And when there were concerns that the people who lived in their communities had, whether or not those concerns were explicit in the Mishnah, they took the time to bring a perspective and new insight into those concerns, right? That this, that this kind of Torah is produced in relationship and in conversation. And everybody in those conversations is bringing in their own interests, their own contexts, in ways that produce new knowledge. And that's really exciting. And I think it's an invitation to all of us to continue that, to continue that process. Maybe without like adding to the Talmud, it's already very long, but, um, but I will leave us with that invitation today. Um, I wish you all a wonderful week, a wonderful Shabbat, um, and good luck in your next week of Kiddushin. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a fun detour. And uh, great to see all of you, talk to all of you. If you're still confused, please feel free to revisit that first piece on Peter Sheen. It's meant to sort of or sort out main, um, main categories in this tractate. And I also linked an article um, in the chat about this Tanaim Amoraim Savoraim. Are the Savoraim the Stamaim? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> right. Um, and if that all is feels a little too in the weeds, that's okay. You can master that at another time. It doesn't have to be known at this moment. But really lovely to talk to all of you. We'll see you in your inbox tomorrow morning in this space next week. Um, and have a great week and a Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you all.